All right, chemists. So right now we're going to look at organic and inorganic compounds, how we can tell the differences, forensic scientists, as well as what use it is looking for them within soil, in particular in that case, inorganic compounds. All right, so what's the point? Well, by the end of this, you should be able to determine or explain how we can determine uh, various hydrocarbons and inorganic salts uh, both in the school lab and in a forensic lab. Now, with say the inorganic salts, it's actually not that much different, except you then include AAS um, and a couple other things like that. Um, but with the hydrocarbons, it's quite different. Uh, you also want to be explained how we can use soil to link a suspect to a crime scene or to to link something that's been moved to where it came from. And we'll have a look at that as we go. All right, so organic and inorganic compounds. Well, let's have a quick look at what they are. There's a bit of bit of revision, so we'll go through this fairly quickly. Organic compounds, they're basically those that contain carbons, as well as hydrogens and oxygens, and sometimes nitrogen and sulfur. Um, they tend to be produced by living things, but we can synthesize them in a lab, so they're not exclusively produced in living things. That's why they're called organic. Um, we've got hydrocarbons, esters, polymers, there are a couple of examples, and we're going to look at the at three in particular, which we'll go over in a minute. Um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, carbonates, hydrogen carbonates, cyanides of metals. These are not these are not organic compounds. So they look like organic compounds, but you need to understand that list of exceptions. Um, so what are inorganic compounds? Well. They're just anything essentially that's not organic. Um, so they exist in both living and non-living non things. Water is an inorga inorganic compound. Um, sodium chloride is an inorganic compound. Um, the main examples that we talk about are water, acids, bases, and salts. So how do we test them? How do we work out what's what? Well, so we get a compound and we burn it. Now when we're burning it, if it's complete combustion and it produces carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, then it's organic. So only organic compounds produce carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide when we burn it. They also react with air and can decompose completely. So if it does these, then it's most certainly organic. All right. So when a metal reacts with air, um, it oxidizes, okay, but it won't decompose completely, it'll make something new, it won't vaporize off into the atmosphere. So we can then confirm these using quantitative tests, like so mass spectroscopy. Um, and if we do this, so if we do some mass spectroscopy, um, we can determine if it has carbon and hydrogen in it. All right, we'll talk more about that sort of stuff in a minute. So basically, we divide our compounds into two types, and here's a little flowchart for you. So it's inorganic compounds, uh, compounds with molecules with no carbon C, C, or carbon CH covalent bonds. And here are our different examples, electrolytes being salts. Um, so we've got our inorganic, so our organic compounds, uh, molecules based on carbon atom chains, and here are several different types. Um, and and we'll, so we've got carbohydrates, we've got lipids, um, we've got proteins that have a lot of extra stuff bad into it and have a quaternary structure. And with this quaternary structure means that it's got this giant 3D structure that it folds around itself. And the structure is actually important. Um, and here's just a table, this is a table just from your book. Um, and we've got some characteristics here which can be used to identify them. Okay. Um, we're going to go to those. If you want to write those down, feel free. All right. So let's have a look at our organic compounds. I would know those, by the way. I'm just going to spend time in the video going through them all for you. So um, get those sorted. Have them in your book. All right. Classes of organic compounds. So we've got three that we, we need to talk about. We have hydrocarbons. Okay. These are our um, alkanes. We have alkanols. So they have the OH group here. Um, so alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. So we have alkanols, and we have our alkanoic acids. So this is, again, just a bit of revision. You should know how to name these by now. This should not be new. Um, 
Here we have our hydrocarbons. So we've got the, the ain, the iron, and the benzene here. Remember benzene being the toluene ring. We have our alkanols, which are also alcohols, but we have our alkanols with the OH group on the side. Um, and over here we have the alkanoic acids. These are these are my favorites. I like these, and I like putting this with that and making an ester. That's my favorite experiment. No, it's one of my favorite experiments to do in the entire course. So we've got our alkanoic acids, and they've got this group here, and that group is pretty cool. All right, so you know how they work. That's all revision, essentially. How do we tell which one we have, though? Um, so we've got a saturated hydrocarbon. You need to know this table. Um, all right, in water, it's insoluble, so it's neither an acid nor a base. Um, reacts with sodium carbonate, it doesn't. It does not react with sodium metal. Now, the saturated part there is the that means it's got it's holding as many hydrogens as possible. And when we put it with bromine without light, if it does react, it reacts very, very slowly. Whereas our unsaturated hydrocarbons, so our our alkane, sorry, our alkenes and alkynes, they are also insoluble. They do not react. They do not react with sodium metal. But with bromine, in the absence of light, they will react, and they'll react very, very fast. So they'll lose the color. They'll, or the bromine will lose its color because they will take on the bromine, um, which you'll now, you now know makes haloalkanes. So you know, tying it all together. We've got our alkanols, which are soluble and neutral. In other words, they hold on to their their hydrogens. Um, they don't react to sodium carbonate. These are real important. We'll see this in a table in a flow chart in a minute. They effervesce hydrogen gas if you put them with sodium metal. Okay, that's important. And they very slowly de so over hours they'll react to the bromine. Alkanoic acids don't react with bromine. Um, they effervesce hydrogen gas, so you can't use that to distinguish between the two. Um, they effervesce carbon dioxide when you put it with carbon with sodium carbonate. So now you're seeing, I hope, a way to tell it apart, to, to work out exactly what it is. They're soluble and they're acidic. Duh. All right. So how do we test it? So here are your equations. These are good good like you need to know examples of these equations and this is a nice little flow chart again from your textbook on how to do it so we have an unknown liquid what do we have what do, what is our sample this is one we can do in schools you wouldn't necessarily you would probably do this if you had a very large sample um, in a lab which is to save some time um, so we have our well oh, I've lost my mouse there it is all right so we've got an unknown liquid here we could add some sodium carbonate if it effervesces it is an alkanoic acid. Cool. If we add some sodium metal, to be honest, this one it is either a, it's either going to be a uh, alkanoic acid or an alkanol. But we added some sodium carbonate and it didn't react to that, so we now know that it is not this. It's an alkanol. Um, doesn't react with either of these. We still don't know what it is. So if we add some bromine to it. Um, if it decolor decolorizes, okay, um, it is an unsaturated solution. If it does not decolorize, so if it stays the same in, in darkness, it's going to be sodium hydro. It's a, sorry, it's a saturated so hydrocarbon. Now, interestingly, this is obviously not the only three tests there are. It is obviously not the only way to do it. However, they are the ways which is which are available to us in a school, and we'll do this in class. So that is not a complete list, clearly. That is just the list that we have. Um, it's the list that we need to go into. There are other ones, but we won't cover those. They're beyond the scope of this course. Now, if you were to do it in a forensics lab, you would do it a bit differently because it's rare that you know, you're know you going to find a, a very large sample. So the tests that we do in a school, they're not appropriate for a forensic chemist generally because our samples are often trace samples, so really small amounts. Um, and they're not sensitive enough for what we need them to do. So sure, it might, those tests will tell us it's a hydrocarbon, but it won't tell us which hydrocarbon or which unsaturated hydrocarbon. Um, there are other ways we could do that in a school lab, but a forensic scientist, they get it a bit easier. So they do infrared spectroscopy. 
So it's a very it's very similar to AAS. Um, uh, so we we shoot infrared light through it, and it's absorbed. It's absorbed by the bonds. So a percentage of radiant of radiation. Now each bond. Um, so for the functional groups, the functional groups, the each bond in the functional groups absorbs different amounts of light. Okay, and because we can tell how much is being absorbed, we can actually usually tell how much is is there. So it's a quantitative measure as well. Um, so di your different functional groups, they have they absorb different wa uh, wavelengths of the radiation, and this means they're unique. So while even this is not a perfect one, remember we need to talk about limitations. Here we can identify um, the functional groups of those compounds. There are other stuff we'll do beyond this, but we can now tell which of each of those functional groups is, whether it's an alkanoic acid, whether it's an alkanol, and or saturated, unsaturated hydrocarbons. Um, so it's really useful in identifying carbohydrates. And these ones, um, and you'll see here, each one has a, they'll have their own individual signature. Um, we can also use it to identify the, so we can use it to identify actual carbohydrates. That's actually not so hard to do. But the OH groups and the alkanoic acids, they're a bit tougher to identify what chain it is, or what the length of the chain, but we can still identify that it has certain groups. Um, so yeah, all right. So acids, bases, and neutral salts. It's pretty much the same in both situations. So you dissolve the, the salt in the water and you measure the pH. Acids, proton donors, pH less than seven. Bases, proton acceptors, um, pH over seven. And neutral salts have a pH of seven. So we can measure these using indicators like bromothyl blue, methyl orange, litmus, universal indicator, or a pH meter for that matter. Um, and over here, we can actually see um, where we use different acids and bases in in forensic chemistry. This is just for interest. It's actually I know know that it's more than just for interest. It's useful. But that's why that's there right now. It's not the most important thing. So we use citric acid um, to reveal fingerprints on adhesive surfaces. Um, cyanoacrylate, we use that to reveal fingerprints on glass. So they basically they you know vaporize the super glue over it. And a neutral salt, silver nitrate, we use to um, come up with our fingerprints on porous substances. All right. Now we're about to finish off with soil tests. So we've got two more slides. Hang in there. We're almost done. Um, so what is soil? It's basically it's a loose mixture on top of the on top of the, the ground, on top of the surface of the earth. Um, some geologists, particularly soil scientists, get really upset when you use the word dirt. Like it really upsets them. So if you know any of these people, call it dirt. It really upsets them. Um, but essentially, it's like 95% inorganic matter. Um, and so we're talking about clay, sand, lots of silicates, that sort of stuff, um, gravel. And then it's got decaying organic, max, or organic matter mixed into it. Um, I don't know why it says hummus. Um, so water, organic matter, and so forth, uh, breaking down leaves. The chemical composition of these varies depending on the geographical location. And, all right, so if you're in the eastern half of Australia, it's got high co concentrations of quartz. But, but, what's even more, it's more specific than that. So, the soil on one end of town is going to be different to the soil in a different part of town. The soil changes as you move within, you know, several hundred metres. So, soil is highly variable but it's also highly distinctive for a certain area. Um, so there are several physical properties we can test, macroscopic properties, properties we can see. So color, um, texture, so it's that, this is the thing, it sounds a bit wishy-washy, but um, if we've got enough of it, we can actually test the texture, texture, and there is a somewhat arbitrary, but numerical way to do it. Um, we can see how does it look in water. Um, the pH. You could use all of those to put together a profile and then compare it with a profile from another area and see what you've got, like see if it's the same deal. Um, you can also the size of the particles. Um, if you get 100 grams of it 
and you run it through different sized sieves, you work out which fraction is each, that should be fairly consistent for soil in that you know close area, especially at certain heights. Um, we, if we need more definitive tests, or if we've got a, um, a very small sample, then we can test the microscopic properties. Uh, pollen, what pollen is left in the area, specific to the plants. Um, the mineral content, so we can do AAS and we can work out the composition of minerals in the soil, as well as the amount of those minerals in the soil. So that's pretty sweet. Um, glass fragments. Glass varies widely, um, but the composition and properties is usually very specific to its manufacturer. And to be honest, very specific to the particular factory. So if you've got, uh, sorry, particular factory. So if you've got one manufacturer, but they've got separate factories, the glass properties will be different at different factories, for the, even though they're going to use roughly the same composition. So why do we do soil tests? Basically, the many, many applications. Uh, footprints. We can show that the perpetrator came from a particular location. However, um, you can match the soil from a footprint with the bottom, of the soil at the bottom of a shoe. Um, and it says here. And that could confirm it. And this doesn't just mean shoes, this means other bits of equipment that will have dirt on it. Soil, sorry. Um, glass fragments, which is found in soil. Um, again, we can track it back to broken headlights, to also any glassware you want, really. Um, one thing that's starting to come up is the glassware from phones. In a violent crime, phones break. And because of the, the mass production of these things, the glass from the Gorilla Glass that's on the cover of most phones, it's fairly specific to kind of the day and the time it was manufactured in the factory. So you can actually usually pinpoint with some degree of certainty if it's come from a certain phone. Anyway, that's interesting. Um, so here we have some evidence from a, a real murder case. Um, this is from South Australia. There was a, well, we won't get into the details of it. Um, a guy was pulled over and he had this stuff in the back of his car, as well as the, the car matched a certain description, as well as these are his shoes. Um, if we look at his shovel, we can see what's been left on his shovel, okay? This stuff here can be used to work out the, the composition of the soil where he was digging, and we can compare this to where the body they found was buried. Um, so, yeah, like it, it's really useful, the soil stuff. And remember, we can do it if we want on a very, you know, if we've got a large sample like you'd have here, we can do the, the really simple stuff, which is still very reliable. Um, if we only have a small sample, then we can do the smaller stuff, which takes more time. So the AAS and so forth. Um, so you can use the shot, we can link this shovel to where it was used to dig a hole in the ground. Does this mean that the person who owns the shovel owns the shovel buried the body that's in that ground? No. All it actually means is they dug a hole somewhere nearby where that certain body was found. So now I've got one piece of evidence, and I want you to really get your get a grasp on this. Is if there's one piece of evidence, this is not a smoking gun. This means th this helps build up a larger picture. The idea of forensics is not to you know, here's your piece of evidence, that convicts, done. The job of forensics is to build up a picture, build a larger picture of what happened in a scene of a crime. Um, and that's it, and I'll see you in class.